everybody, this is Mike Oppenheim, and you are listening to Coffin Talk, Interviews with the Living, a weekly podcast that explores how our views on death affect the way we live our life. This week, coming to us from Richmond, Virginia, is a dear friend and also somebody I admire from far away, uh, but constantly because of the work she does. Her name is Kristen Johnson, and she currently serves as the Director of Development and Community Engagement for Real Life. They are a nonprofit organization that provides holistic support and services to individuals impacted by incarceration, homelessness, or substance use disorder. Uh, Kristen is also the president elect of the Junior League of Richmond and was recognized as one of Style Weekly's top 40 under 40. In her spare time, she loves cheering on the Washington Capitals and the Nationals and photography, reading, and building Lego. Kristen currently resides in Richmond with her partner, Mike, and their two cats, Marauder and Wilson. And I will delete this if it's not okay to say, but they're getting married in the end of April next year, and I'm attending, and I cannot wait to go. Kristen, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm great. Is that last part okay to leave in? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. Congratulations, uh, just to say it live and on the air. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I really do mean what I said in the intro. Um, I nearly went to a conflict resolution program, and the whole purpose of my life was going to be to help substance uh, use disorder and people who are homeless, and also to work with incarcerated felons. So literally the three things that you're doing now. And... Uh, of course, I did not go to that program, and I ended up going to a writing program instead. So I'm a useless piece of crap, and you are doing uh, <laughs> the Lord's work, in my opinion. So seriously, thank you. We usually ask people how old they are, where they grew up, and what generation, if any, they are a member of. So do you want to just answer those three questions real quick? Yeah, sure. So I just turned 40 this past August, so I'm no longer under 40, but I have joined the 40 Club. Um I have found the first few gray hairs, so I'm going in a few weeks to get my hair highlighted because... Yeah, I'm not okay with that. Um, so I am that, I guess that weird generation, the Zennials or the, um, the the elder millennials or the geriat, whatever. There's some sort of term, but basically the, the old millennials, which I hate. Um, so <laughs> it, uh, I tend to, you know, I'm in that weird generation where really we're on the cusp of millennials um but i grew up with a lot of the same you know with, with the level of technology that was more akin to what generation uh, x grew up with so i'm kind of i'm kind of in the middle straddling both lines um you know we had the the prodigy uh internet service when i was a kid i still <laughs> that's awesome that you knew that wow yeah, <laughs> yeah. So remember like back when it was safe to hang out in chat rooms um <laughs> that's kind of where i where i fit in and and uh where did you grow up actually was it in richmond or no so i grew up in loudon county up in northern virginia so if you're familiar with where dallas airport is that is on the easternmost border of loudon county i grew up in downtown leesburg for most of my i guess middle to late childhood which was awesome because i could literally and it was Safe back then. I could literally ride my bike to um, my favorite place in the world, Rust Library, which was our local library. Um, really, from the time I was probably 10 on, I was allowed to ride my bike. I could ride the bike uh, over and spend a couple hours at the library, or I could walk downtown uh, to downtown Leesburg with my friends and go have milkshakes at, uh, at the Leesburg restaurants. And, you know, it was, it was really cool. It's interesting because, like, you know, I'm I have like a young daughter now, and when you say that, I like I get so sad thinking that like I'm not supposed to let her bike somewhere for two miles anymore, and that's just like makes me sad. So, and I'm curious, like the line of work that you do, I, I know the reasons I wanted to get into it, um, but what drew you to that, and how old were you when you really got drawn into that? So it, there's kind of this ongoing uh, this, this funny joke that all fundraisers say. Um, cause really my job in large part with real life is fundraising and community engagement. So I do our grants, I do our social media, I do our appeal letters, our campaigns, um, I do volunteer projects. So if a corporation or a church group or uh, a Boy Scout troop wants to come in and do a volunteer project with us, I'm the one coordinating that. Um, I coordinate, you know, gifts in kind. So if someone wants to donate, Furniture, we opened the new house, uh, you know, all of that falls under my purview, all of our marketing, um, a pretty wide scope of things. There's kind of a joke among fundraisers that if you'd asked any of us what we wanted to be when we grew up, when we were kids, none of us would say fundraisers. <laughs> um, it's something you kind of fall into. 
um, when I was in middle school, I did a mock trial at the Leesburg Courthouse. During that mock trial, I was a prosecutor. I was one of the Commonwealth attorneys. I was one of the prosecutors um, in Virginia. We call them Commonwealth attorney. And I fell in love with the law and with, you know, being a courtroom attorney. And I was, I was, this is what I want to do with my life. So really from the time I was, would have been eighth grade. So the time I was 13 on, um, that was my kind of, that was my path and my goal um, that I followed and, you know, went straight through undergrad. We call them K through JD. So literally I went straight through to law school and went William Mary undergrad, then University of Richmond for law school and got out of law school. My third year of law school, I was sick and they weren't really sure what was wrong with me. It eventually, a couple of years later, ended up being diagnosed um, as inflammatory arthritis, similar to rheumatoid arthritis. But at the time, I was really struggling, um, and so it kind of, I kind of changed my path a little bit. I, I knew I still wanted to eventually be a commonwealth attorney, uh, being a prosecutor, but I knew it wasn't the right time, and so I started working as an adjunct professor at VCU and started teaching criminal law. I was about two years in, and life happened, um, and I had to get a full-time job. I couldn't, you know, just keep being a perpetual student, financially speaking. Um, as much as I would have loved to have done that. So, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so I left the program, and at that time, um, keep in mind that was 2009 at that point. So that was oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> economy, yeah, economy had totally collapsed, um, and, like, getting a job as a lawyer was not going to happen. Um, literally, I was applying for paralegal jobs. Uh, there was, like, nothing out there. And so I ended up as a magistrate. Wow. For those who aren't familiar, a magistrate is basically, you're, you're a judi- in Virginia, each state's a little bit different, but in Virginia, you're a judicial officer, um, and typically you work out of the jails, uh, and you are the one that is on duty when someone is brought in after being arrested. Uh, you determine if there's probable cause to write an arrest warrant. If there is, you write the warrant, then you do the bond hearing. You evaluate probable cause for a search warrant, um, for emergency protective orders, uh, temporary detention orders, and emergency commitment orders related to mental health crises. Um, So really, you're kind of on the front lines doing the emergency stuff, often in the middle of the night. I mean, you know, you're on 24-7, seven seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, And I did that for about seven years, and I... um, I was miserable. Um, I hated it. I hated that. Um, I hated that when people were at their worst and their lowest point in their life, and they would come before me and ask for help, there was nothing I could do. Um, the The system was not set up for me to provide any sort of support or help. Um, for bond, I could order them to something called pretrial services. Um, but really, that would just consist of, you know, maybe a few random drug screens, and that's it. It wasn't any sort of support network or, or actual help. Um, so it was very, very draining. It kind of skipped being a prosecutor, jumped to this. Uh, this is what I thought I always wanted to do, and I hate it. So I started doing a lot of volunteer work. One of my friends worked for an organization at the time called uh, Cancer Link. Um, Link stands for Legal Information Network for Cancer. And so I started volunteering with them. Um, kind of became my second full-time job, to be honest, because uh, one of the cool things about being a magistrate is you're on 24-7, but as long as no one's coming before you, you know, they're, you're not needed for a hearing, you you can sleep, you can watch TV, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> Each week, uh, depending on what was going on, I could average... I mean, I could average 40 hours a week in that job uh, or in that volunteer role. Um, she, my friend was like, you would really love event planning. Cause I, you know, I was social chair when I was in law school, I was in my sorority and did, um, you know, did social events for them. So she's like, you'll really like this. So I ended up um, co-chairing their gala committee, um, helping with big volunteer projects, um, you know, just really and logging a number of hours, and I discovered I absolutely loved it. Um, I am a helper by nature. That is where I get my energy and my my energy and my strength. And so um, 
I decided, and I spent plenty of time, you know, I didn't make the decision lightly to completely career switch. Um, you know, I obviously had gone through law school. That is not cheap. Um, and I wanted to make sure it was truly what I wanted to do. So I, I spent probably a good two years volunteering with them. Like I said, I loved it. I was I was feeling fulfilled. I could actually get through my work as a magistrate because I was enjoying my volunteer work. Um, and so I started working, uh, I started applying for jobs, was eventually hired uh, by the Virginia Foundation for Community College Education. And I worked there in fundraising for right about three years. Um, and now I really, it's pretty cool looking back at that, how I've come full circle um, from the frustration of not being able to help to now helping raise the resources every day that that help uh, and then make a difference. I mean, that's just incredible. And I, I think I, I had a lot of takeaways from that. But one of my favorite things you said was that you got to this point where you said, this is what I was always thought I wanted to do. And I hate it. And I think for every person, first of all, a lot of people get there, I think, but I think most of them stay <laughs> and they aren't able to leave or they don't think they're able to leave. I'm curious, what would you say to any person out there, whether they're younger or even older than you, who feels that exact sentiment? What would you suggest to them? I mean, really, I think that's why I did so much volunteer work um, is there are always organizations that really great organizations that need volunteers. And it does, it doesn't mean you don't have to want to go into nonprofits to volunteer with a nonprofit. So if you think your love is social media and marketing, I guarantee you there's a nonprofit that would love to have you volunteer with them. And you can actually try it on for size and see if it's a good fit. Um, you know, it, it, that, that was what was most successful for me. Um, you know, if, if you think you may want to nonprofits, is every, it, yeah, nonprofits take everything. So like they need lawyers, they need, you know, you, you can try, you can try it on for size. Um, you know, most nonprofits are not going to turn you away. That's so cool. After my divorce and moving to Arizona, I, I didn't want to enter the education market here as a teacher because the pay is so lousy. I ended up volunteering at a hospice ward, which I ended up loving, but also I was like, no, I'm never going to go get my CNA or any of these other licenses and do this for a living. So it's cool that that is really the best advice ever. And I wish in reverse, I had known about that. I mean, there's so many opportunities I could have done when I was younger. So first of all, thank you. And we just had a police officer on last week and your fiance used to be one and he was on our podcast. And so I know you're like, you're a helper by nature. And so I know that you and I have the exact same goal, which is not to punish people, but to actually help them. So first of all, my really basic question is, are prisons rehabilitation centers in your opinion? See, that's the other problem about interviewing a lawyer uh, is it's always going to be a depends. <laughs> <laughs> so here's this, I would say they are trying more and more. They're trying to be. It's not something that has been for a long period of time, but at real life, for example, um, there are a number of facilities in and around Richmond that have started using our curriculum and programming and where we have staff actually go in and provide the services. Um, real life started in the Richmond City Jail as the real program. So I, I think they're trying to be and there is always room for growth, but it depends on the facility itself. That's great. No, I, and this is why I wanted to ask you the questions. And you're a lawyer, so that the combination of your intelligence and heart is working in my favor. Okay, so then I think a lot of people have a huge stigma against returning citizens. And I think there's, you know, reasons for it and also reasons where it's just pathetic. But what should we as non-returning citizens, just regular citizens, do better or could we do to help out these returning citizens? All of us are one bad decision away from being in their place. And I think that's something we have to remember. And a lot of times, not that there are excuses for their behavior, but there are reasons for their behavior. Um, there's there's some really fantastic work that we deal with a lot um, um, that really helps helps you better understand um, kind of how folks' brains are wired differently um, through adverse childhood experiences. Um, so I would highly recommend anyone who's interested in learning a little bit more, do some reading on ACEs. Um, it came out of a great study 
um, actually related to weight loss in women, um, where this doctor was like, well, why, you know, these women, would, some are losing weight, some aren't, and they're all doing the same things biologically, they, you know, they, they all should be, um, and it came down to, uh, he, he accidentally asked a question and phrased it incorrectly, but it came down to those that were having trouble, a large number of those that were having trouble losing the weight um, had been sexually abused. And so, um, and not all ACEs are, you know, to that extreme. Um, it could be, you know, your parents got divorced. That's an adverse childhood experience. Um, you lost a loved one. Um, and, and ACEs affect everyone differently. So, for example, you know, you and a sibling might have gone through the exact same experiences, but your elder sibling might have protected you more from them. So you may be more resilient and better able to cope with those ACEs versus your sibling. Um, so there's some really interesting work out there. So there are reasons, not that there are excuses, um, because, you know, and that's something we, we really focus on with lifers. Is it's not making excuses but it's understanding what led, what led down this path and this behavior. Um, I would also say that 95% of people that are incarcerated are going to be released at some point. And so those that are still skeptical about the work we do at real life, we always, we always say, Hey, would, would you rather them come out with no services and no support? Or would you rather have a better neighbor? Um, Cause 95% of folks are getting out someday. Yeah. Oh gosh. I mean, okay. I'm going to jump topics. I'm going to go to what I want to ask now and then we'll come back to maybe some of this stuff. But with you, I felt like it was important to get into your life work first and get a feeling for who you are and what you do. But now I definitely want to ask, what do you think is going to happen when you die? I mean, it sounds cliche, but I, I mean, I, I do believe in heaven and I, I am a Christian. I, you know, I, I do believe that I will someday be re reunited with, with my loved ones. I think a lot of that comes from my positivity. Um, generally, I'm a very positive and hopeful person. And to me, that helps provide some hope, you know, that there is something else there afterwards. I mean, I'm right with you. I'm not literally a Christian right with you, but I'm right with you that A, positivity matters, and B, you know, I, I do this inter these interviews enough. I think you're guest 100-something that your answer is not the most popular one, but it's up there, and I, and I never question or attack it because it's it's your belief but i always am curious um linking this to aces and the concept first of all have you had an adverse childhood experience it's basically your aces score so it, it's and you can find it online and, and it's basically like a survey that you go through and if you've experienced you know it, it used to be 10 questions i think maybe now it's up to 20 but if you've experienced um that situation then you add a point and your total number of points at the end kind of dictates because I, I mean, I don't know a single person alive that hasn't dealt with an adverse childhood experience at some point. Um, and so um, really it's, it's how many and whether you had the resilience and the support network to help you address those. That's actually something we're working on at real life in the community is to try to help educate uh, stakeholders and leaders in the communities that are hardest hit uh, with the children's hardest hit by ACEs um, so that they can try to help support them and teach them about building resilience um, to try to help, help put ourselves out of business. Cause really that's, that should be the goal of most nonprofits is to put yourself out of business. Um, if you're doing, if you're doing your work well enough, then you shouldn't need to exist. Well, I mean, that wasn't where I was leading with that, but I, I still think it's a good answer. I was more just curious if your own childhood set a template for wanting to help other people who went through an experience or not, or if you just naturally want to help people. Oh, Oh, I think, um, I think naturally I just want to help people. Um, yeah, like I said, I had a really good childhood. I think, I think I recognize how fortunate I was in that I had a good childhood. Um, and I definitely growing up, I would see children who were going, were going through things, um, and did not have the same advantages that I was blessed that my family could provide for me. And so, I was aware from a young age of 
some of these issues. Um, but I never, you know, I, I never, that wasn't necessarily what drew me to this work. I think really it was, it was the, those seven years of seeing it day after day. Now, they weren't childhood experiences, but certainly there were things I heard and I saw as a magistrate that were deeply upsetting um, and, you know, that, that I even sought out counseling um, because there is such a thing as vicarious trauma. And so if you're having to listen to testimony over and over again about, um, you know, child abuse um, or sexual abuse or things like that, that can be very, very difficult. I've never heard it phrased vicarious trauma, but that's so, it resonates so deeply with me. And I think that's absolutely true. And, you know, they talk about like doctors um, have like a really high alcoholism rate. And again, you know, not all doctors or anything like that, but, you know, just what do you do to like shake the experiences of like constant contact with death? And like I said, you know, I did hospice for only three years and it did make me like by the third year, I would walk in and like high five the like nurses and like, we'd be like joking as there's like a person dying in front of us. And like, it looks so crass, but like these people need some uptick on their day, you know? And everyone has different ways of coping with death and with the trauma that they see. And, you know, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, it's all appropriate. It's, you know, it's joking around, obviously I wouldn't do it or encourage it in front of a patient's family. But certainly, you know, if, if that helps the nurses and the doctors and the staff, you know, kind of push through that trauma, then that, you know, that that's fine. I did learn from my time as a magistrate and working at Cancer Link um, that did help me realize I'm way too soft hearted and wear my emotions on my sleeve. Um, that did help me realize I could not or I would not be as effective actually providing the services. Um, and so that's why I love my role so much is I get to help support and, and help make those services happen. But I, knowing myself, I would not be the right person to provide those services. Yeah. So, I mean, gosh, this is fascinating. I, so I grew up in like probably the most atheistic area of the country, um, the Bay area, San Francisco of California, not literally in the city of San Francisco, but my point being, I was not exposed to a lot of religious people. I was exposed to people who were very vehemently against believing in God, let alone having a religion. Uh, this was not my parents. This was not my upbringing, but the general vibe was that. And so I'm just constantly amazed as I left at 18 on purpose to see what the heck the rest of the country was like. I don't meet these Christians that I hear heard about growing up and I meet all these people like you who are like, Oh, and just help people. And well, everyone's going to heaven, you know, even if you like rape someone, that's just like, that's God's plan. And like, you know, so I'm like, I'm just curious, how do you think if you'd never been Christian, you'd never even heard that word and you weren't raised religious. Do you think you would still just be this awesome beacon of like, you know, compassion and awareness. And again, not a moron. Like you did say like, look, these aren't excuses. They're just understanding their reasons. That's why you're, a guest on the show because you're very compassionate, but you're also very intelligent. I mean, do you just think like your religion like actually developed your compassion or do you think it's just a coincidence? I didn't grow up going to church. Well, when I was very little, I used to go to church with my Nana Wiley, but it was mainly so I could sit next to her in the choir. Um, like really from age 10 <laughs> on, um, once we moved, because we had lived in Maryland at the time, so I could literally go, Go with church, to go to church with my Nana Wiley, sit next to her in the choir, come home. Pop up would have made tomato soup and grilled cheese using tomatoes from his garden, and like that—that well, that was my Sunday afternoons with my grandparents, and I loved it. Um, but I didn't really grow grow up going to church um, or or anything like. It wasn't like I grew up. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't like I grew up in an uber in, a, in an uber religious household or anything like that. Like, mom was Presbyterian, dad was Catholic. Um, you know, we'd go to church, I'd go with dad, to that, um, Christmas Eve, mass on Christmas Eve with dad, you know, it was, but it wasn't like I grew up having religion constantly in my face. I just kind of, I think just the, the positive way I grew up with the religion kind of on the side is what made me the way I am. So I, I don't, I don't think that, I don't think that religion has driven my personality or my nature, I think it just kind of maybe complements it as a way to think of it. I mean, I would like to think, and I, I believe that I, I would, you know, I'd be the same person 
or, you know, be the same way regardless of whether I was an atheist or a Christian or, you know. Yeah. Like, let's say you die and then there is like a God who like could speak or communicate with you and they say like, hey, no offense, but you got it completely wrong. Christianity is not the truth. There is no heaven, but like, you're still a great soul and we love you and all that. Would you, do you think you'd be like bummed or do you think you're like, yeah, okay, whatever. Hey everyone, if you're a fan of the show, please head over to MikeyOp.com and click the subscribe button. It's the best way to support us and it's free. That's M-I-K-E-Y-O-P-P dot com. Thanks. Um, I think I'd be bummed in the sense that, you know, I do look forward to seeing the people that I've lost someday, but not that I'd be bummed that I got it wrong. The thought that I could be with my Nana Wiley and Pop-Up Wiley and Nana and Pop-Up Johnson and my great grandma or like, you know, the people that I've lost, the fact that I could be with them again someday, that's, that's really powerful. That's more what I look forward to than being like, oh, I was right, you know, <laughs> like that's more what, you know, if, if it weren't the case, that's more what I would be bummed about. I think that's kind of why I'm like hosting the show and doing this is I'm just more curious, like how other people deal with like, you know, because uh, as we do this interview, I'm just realizing more and more how much we have in common, which is that like, I just want Earth to be a good place. I want people to be good. I want the universe to be good. I want the the end of this life to be good. Like I'm just rooting all of us on and I can tell you are too. But the difference is like, and I say this with like the utmost respect, I don't feel like I have your intellectual and factual approach to like crime specifically and criminals because you were the magistrate for so long. And so I've seen dark things and I know that they exist, but I haven't really like seen it over and over again to the point where I had to seek counseling. And then, you know, like I said, we interviewed your husband earlier and I know he's seen <laughs> he shared enough with me so i am kind of curious like when you're teaming up with someone who is just as caring as you are this is these are my words my opinions this is like if i gave a speech at your wedding i would not say the second part of this but like also he's not in the same optimism boat as you not even close you and i how does that affect you like not i'm not asking about like how does your marriage work or you know how will it work i'm just more like curious does that balance you does that help you i think he and i balance each other um, I think that's something that, and, and he's told me this, that, you know, my positivity and my optimism is something he really admires and, and drew him towards me, just like his intellect. And I don't, I don't want to say pessimism. He likes to put on, and he, I know he kind of did, a, uh, I've heard the, I've heard the episode, of, you know, he was oh, very open and honest. So not to say he puts on, but he has a very public facing persona and then he has his way more like a, a, not a different way, but a more complex way with me, I guess is, is a good way to put it. I, I think we balance each other. And I think I help pull him over a little bit more to the optimistic side, but recognizing that, you know, I, I don't want to change him. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a balance. <laughs> That's so cool. Um, well, I, I've, run out of time i still have like a lot of questions but you did actually get to like everything i needed to ask and i think you gave wonderful answers so i always let my guests give uh their like just peace out there like whatever you want to get out to my audience i would love to hear it um and then we'll wrap things up i would just say don't judge a book by its cover and you know don't assume when you see something or read something about someone don't assume that that is the end all be all we're not supposed to have quote unquote favorites, but one of my favorite lifers that I ever worked with, um, he's a sex offender. And so if you had shown me, you know, if, if I knew that before I met him, um, I might have, you know, who knows? I may have approached it differently. I don't know. But at the end of the day, he's a wonderful, caring person who has gone out of his way to address the substance abuse disorder. So he, He's a wonderful person, um, and I would have missed out on that friendship had I judged him by what he had done in the past. Wow, that's so powerful. Thank you so much, Kristen, for coming on. Um, this interview just made me even more excited to see you in a couple months. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you for fundraising. It's it's really important, and thank you. And thank you for seven years of magistrate work. Um, I, I actually did not know that. I am blown away. <laughs> to everyone else listening at home, I also want to thank you. Um, we're way over episode 100 at this point, and it's just been a wild ride, and I love doing the show. And then, as always, the best way to support the show is just to sign up for free at MikeyOp.com to the weekly newsletter. This is 
is Mike Oppenheim. This has been Coffin Talk, and we will see you soon. And then I see that you see me, and I see you hear this tune, and I feel that you're near me, and I sing you are my moon.